time with our sonny. Because our guest speaker today is Dr. Andrew Snelling. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with him, uh, you're probably familiar because of all of the research, articles, videos, presentations that are available on the website of Answers in Genesis. He is responsible, directs, in charge, leads research for that entire division of Answers in Genesis. Uh, several of us had the privilege, truly, of joining him on a rafting trip all the way down the Colorado River uh, through the beautiful Grand Canyon, but at the same time, a canyon that shows the destruction and God's judgment upon this earth. But Dr. Andrew Snelling, in a way that only he can, and you're going to see it this morning, explained how all of it proves the Genesis flood, and at the same time, God can take judgment and make a beautiful thing out of it. And that's the God that we serve, and we are privileged to have him today. Would you give a warm Quentin Road welcome to Dr. Andrew Snelling. Thank you for coming. recognized Pastor Dave this morning. I knew the face, but the clothes were different. The last time I saw him, it was in the Grand Canyon with all the wind and the sand and everything like that. Well, it's great to be back here. I almost feel like at home when I walk in here. I've been here a few times and it's great. And uh, it's, it's uh, always wonderful to share God's word with people. So class, put your seatbelts on and let's get into it. Fossils and rock layers, the flood not evolution and millions of years. And I'm going to scoot through this very quickly this morning to help you. When you see this diagram in, in textbooks and in museums, many people think that this is an artifact. 
that this has been an artist's rendition and it's not reality. Uh, from a biblical standpoint, people look at that and say, well, no, there's been no evolution of life. And yet, uh, when you think about it, the first organisms on that uh, diagram are actually complex anyway. And there's no evidence there shown of uh, simple chemicals turning into, into life. But uh, the, those fossils are selected. And let's come and ask ourselves a question. When it comes to the rock and fossil record, is it real or is it simply uh, contrived to support evolution in millions of years? That's an important question because we need to train our children to think biblically because when they go to college, uh, they're going to be faced with these issues. And if we don't teach them correctly how to think and work through these issues, then they're going to be uh, tripped up by the pervasive promotion of evolution in millions of years. And we talk about the geologic column. I prefer to call it the rock record, and we'll come to that in a minute. But we're going to look at this morning, does it show evolutionary development? And do the rocks date at millions of years old in the geologic time scale? We see this diagram also in textbooks and people think, ah, okay, that's the evolutionary tree of life. Um, what, what they don't realise is that uh, the tips are all that's there. All the connecting things, that's the artist's part. And then we see this geological time scale. So let's walk through this carefully. The rock layers are real. Uh, you know, you can go and rub your nose in them. They're there, so they're not contrived. And furthermore, the local sequences of rock layers in any one area generally follow the order that's in that, ge that geologic column diagram. And uh, that's important to recognise. That geological column is based on real data on observational data of real rock layers. And these local rock sequences can be connected across regions and even between continents. And I'm going to show you this morning rock layers that extend right across North America and to other continents. So they're the same rock layer and that makes sense because when you think about it you'd expect global dep deposition of rock layers during a global catastrophic flood. So the, rock, the fossils in those rock layers generally follow the order that we see in the fossil record. But we need to understand why, and we will. The issue is that they don't show all the fossils that are there. One thing they don't show you is that the marine fossils continue all the way through the record. Well, after all, when the, when the flood came, the ocean waters rose over the continents and they would have carried ocean creatures and buried them up on the continents. And that's what we find. In fact, here's an interesting observation. We don't find the, the marine creatures buried on the ocean floor. We find them buried up on the continents. Isn't that interesting? Because they don't live there on the continents, that's where they're buried. So, as uh, Pastor Dave said, the Grand Canyon. The reason why the Grand Canyon is unique there are other larger canyons, deeper canyons, wider canyons, longer canyons. But the Grand Canyon is unique because, first of all, it's a desert, so the biology doesn't cover up the geology. I, I remind my bio biology friends about that. They don't like that. But uh, we can see the rock layers exposed to view, and we see a very complete, se a near complete sequence. In fact, we can walk from the bottom of the Grand Canyon up to the, the rim of the Grand Canyon, and then we keep climbing up as what, what is known as the Grand Staircase. We go up through Zion National Park all the way up to Bryce Canyon National Park and we've, we've traversed something like 14,000, 15,000 feet of rock layers that follow the sequence in the geologic record, in the geologic column. And so you can actually walk these layers. And so here we are in the Western Grand Canyon now that'll bring back memory to Pastor Paul and Pastor Dave. Uh, we climbed up to the top of a waterfall and looked upstream. There's the view. And that's the narrowest part of the canyon there, by the way, where we see the Precambrian crystalline basement rocks that go back to the creation week. And then we see the sedimentary layers before the flood that have only microscopic fossils in them. And then we see suddenly all the marine fossils. 
in the Paleozoic layers. Uh, that's, that's, that's in the western Grand Canyon. Let's go back to where we started our river trip. That's the view from uh, the launch area. And the, the top of the Grand Canyon sequence is there down by the river level. And as we go downstream, of course, we go through down all through those layers. But to the north, we can see some of these other layers, the, the chocolate cliffs, the vermilion cliffs, the white cliffs are the cliffs that you see at Zion National Park. The pink cliffs are way up there. At, uh, there's the white cliffs at Zion National Park. The sandstone there is 2,000 feet thick. It's stupendous. And then we go all the way up to the pink cliffs at, at uh, Bryce Canyon, and that's the top of the sequence at the end of the flood and afterwards. So we can actually walk this sequence of layers. Therefore, it's a real sequence. It's not contrived. And we can see the fossils in this sequence. And notice we start pre-flood with only microscopic fossils. And that's possible in the pre-flood world, that you know, my microscopic creatures would get buried. Uh, for example, there are structures called stromatolites where, where the, they're like blue-green algal mats, slime on the sand surface in the intertidal zone. The, water, water, the tide comes in and puts sand on top of it and buries them, and then they grow up on top and they keep on building these layers, and some of those algae, algae have been uh, fossilised. So that's the pre-flood world with tides and everything. But it's then we get to the Tapete Sandstone, the first layer of the Grand Canyon, we start to get all these marine creatures. And you'll see, by and large, all the way through the layers in the Grand Canyon, we only find marine creatures except for the trackways of some vertebrates. And that's an interesting thing. We find the trackways before we find the body fossils, the skeletons, sometimes supposedly millions of years apart. How could a creature make its tracks and then millions of years later it gets buried? It doesn't make any sense. And so that's the, that's the sequence of the Grand Canyon layers. And then we go, we go above that, we go above that, and we start to get the land creatures buried. We don't find the dinosaurs in, until we get to the layers above the Grand Canyon layers. And so, as I said before, and we get increasingly more um, an, um, land animals and plants, but we still have marine creatures buried all the way through because the ocean waters were still oscillating over the continents during the flood. So we've seen that this is real, except there are, uh, there are extra fossils there than they show. They've chosen those fossils to show what they believe is evolution, but they forget to tell you all about the marine creatures that are buried with the land creatures which is exactly what you'd expect. And we'll, we'll see some more of that in a minute, if time permits. OK, so how should we respond? God doesn't lie. So if the rock sequences and fossil record they contain are real, how can we explain them? And this is where we need to think biblically. God's word is our authority. God was there. He knows everything. He doesn't lie. He's told us what happened. He saw what happened because he did it. And so we can understand the world around us based on what God's word tells us because he has told us the true history of the earth and the creatures and plants that he created. This is the history book of the universe. I like to remind people actually, and we'll talk about more of this this morning in the, in the church service, the scriptures begin with Jesus the creator and then we have Jesus the promised redeemer who comes and then it finishes with Jesus, the, the coming and reigning victorious king. So it's actually his story. It's history from beginning to end. And what do we read in Genesis 6 through 9? There was a catastrophe. A catastrophe. I like to remind people that, uh, you know, on Mars, the planet Mars, where there's no liquid water today, there are features that the geologists believe were caused by a global flood on Mars. They call it the Noachian period. But on a planet where there's no liquid water today, they say there was a global flood, compared to the Earth, which is still 70% covered with water, and they say there never was a global flood. That's why the Apostle Peter says they are willingly ignorant. The evidence is there. There was a catastrophe. And what would we expect to find? Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the Earth. You heard that before? And that's exactly what we find. Billions of dead things called fossils buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And we find death, death, death. But there wasn't death in God's good creation. Death occurred as a, a consequence of man's rebellion. And the flood is a reminder of God's judgment that God hates sin. 
He said he was going to destroy the earth with man. And so we see evidence of carnivory in the fossil record because the earth was filled with violence before the flood and it was filled with disease. Uh, you know, the dinosaur fossils we often find with broken bones that are healed. We even find cancer and, and other things. In fact, there's a whole field now called paleopathology where they actually study the pathology of the fossil bones to see that the diseases that were around in the past. And of course, here we see thorns in the fossil record that are supposedly 400 million years old. But, but were there thorns and thistles in the Garden of Eden? No. The thorns and the thistles only came after man sinned. We're specifically told in Genesis 3 that God may cause the, the thorns to appear, to make work hard, to, make the, 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 to curse the ground for man's sake. You realise that? God cursed the ground for man's sake so that we would look to him for our redemption and, and look forward to the eternity that he has prepared for us. So yes, we'd expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by all of the earth. So how does a fish get fossilised? Look at this fossil fish with the skeleton. It beautifully preserved the eye sockets, the, the fins, the ribs. Well, let's suppose this guy is hungry and he decides he's going to get his breakfast, so he goes to get his breakfast, but what happens, he doesn't realise, he's distracted, he's got tonnes of sand and mud falling down on him, and he's frozen in an instant. Because that's what we find. We find fossils like this one here that can only be explained by rapid, instant burial. The preservation that we see in the fossil record. You know, in England, in a museum there, they've got a fossilised squid, supposedly 400 million years old, and they've got a drawing of the, of the uh, animal when it was alive, and the ink that was used to do the drawing was found in the, in the ink sac of the fossil. It hadn't dried out. So how could it be 400 million years old? How would it survive still wet in the ink sac? What about this fossil here? This is a marine reptile called an ichthyosaur, She's six feet long and she was fossilised giving birth to a baby. I mean, that doesn't happen slowly and gradually. A six foot long creature takes a lot of sand and mud to bury. And uh, so we see this preservation in the fossil record that indicates it had to be catastrophic rapid burial. Here we see a fossil jellyfish. That's not a, that's not a flower, by the way, that's a jellyfish fossil. And these were discovered in outback South Australia back in 1946. <clears throat> and the geologists who found them, hundreds of them over 400 square miles, said they had to form in less than a day. Why? Because you all know that a jellyfish washed up on the beach either melts in the sun or gets destroyed by the waves pounding on the beach. And so they have to get buried rapidly, just like these creatures here called sea lilies or crinoids. <clears throat> They're not actually plants. There's a little critter that lives inside the head there and it moves these fronds that are made up of lime, this stacked on top of one another to catch food particles. But when it dies, all those things fall apart. So it has to have been buried alive to be preserved like that, just like this fossil wasp. Look at the state of preservation of the wings and this flower. We all know that flowers rot and decay very rapidly. I, I remember uh, uh, reading about an experiment they did off the coast of California some years ago. They took a dead whale carcass, mounted it with cameras, towed it out to sea and sunk it, and they watched. Within three to four weeks, everything was gone because it, got rot it went rotten and got eaten by scavengers. Totally, even the bones. So to preserve these creatures requires catastrophic burial. And so what do we see in the fossil record? We see evidence of death, disease, destruction, we see evidence of rapid burial in a catastrophe, the flood. Not millions of years. It doesn't take millions of years to make fossils. We also see evidence of rapid appearance, sudden appearance in the fossil record. As I said before, we go from no fossils, suddenly in the fossil record we see all these creatures. In fact, in the, the first layers of the flood, we see every complex organism body plan that is still in, alive today. Well, that makes sense because remember, all the creatures, most of the creatures in the fossil record were alive a day before the flood. 
They were contemporaneous. They show evidence of God's creative handiwork. And then God buried them in the flood. So they suddenly appear in the fossil record. I remember my colleague, John Whitmore, at Cedarville University, jolly professor, he went to a lecture by Stephen Jay Gould, arguably the greatest uh, geologist, uh, paleontologist of the 20th century. And Stephen Gould had written about this problem where you go from no fossils to all these complex fossils. They call it the Cambrian explosion. And uh, so he went up to the microphone at the end of the presentation and he, at the Q&A and he said, Dr. Gould, can you explain the Cambrian explosion? You know, how these creatures suddenly evolved in all their complexity. What was his answer? There was silence for 30 seconds, and then he said, next question. He didn't answer it because he didn't have an answer. But it makes sense, doesn't it, in, in, from the biblical account. All these creatures were alive. They'd been created by God. They'd lived through the pre-flood era. Uh, and then suddenly they all got buried. And, you know, even the simplest cell, we go back before the flood. I talked about those uh, algae. You know, back in Charles Darwin's day, they thought that the cell was exceedingly simple. It was like a blob of jelly. They didn't have the microscopes that we have today to look at the complexity. And yet, you know what? Back in the 1980s, there was an evolutionary uh, biologist who said the cell is so complex, remember, the cells that make up our bodies can fit on the less than the size of a pinhead. He said they're so complex, they're more complex than a, city of, than a city the size of Chicago, London, or New York. And why? Because miniaturised in less than the size of a pinhead, you've got the nucleus, which is the control centre of the brain. You've got a transport system. You've got mitochondria, which are factories. They're highly complex. Where do they come from? We don't see evidence of chemicals forming these complex cells. These cells appear suddenly in the fossil record. Why? Because God created them complex right from the start. And here we see evidence of, of, of complex life. The earliest, uh, these, these are supposedly 3.5 billion years old, supposedly, and yet they're highly complex. We see the complete cellular structure right from the very beginning. And then we move into these, suddenly, as the flood begins, we begin, we see these flatworms. Uh, and some of them are exquisitely preserved, or trilobites. Let me tell you about the trilobite. Why, why do we call it a trilobite? Well, you Americans say trilobite. But I say trilobite because it's tri, three lobes, three lobes. See, science isn't all that difficult to understand when you break it down like that. And it's not the head, the middle, and the tail. Though it is the head up the left-hand so end, you can see there. But it's actually got three lateral, it's got a main lobe down the centre, and it's got two side lobes. But look at those knobs at the head end. They're actually the eyes of the trilobite. And here we see, magnified, the eye of a trilobite, supposedly 429 million years old. What do we see? We see it's made up of complex multiple lenses. Not one lens, you and I have got one lens in each eye, but the trilobite had multiple lenses. Why? Well, it lived on the ocean floor, we believe, because it's extinct now as far as we know, but we think it lived on the ocean floor because that's where we find it buried with other ocean floor creatures. And you imagine it's on the ocean floor, it's got predators lurking all over it, but then you've got the water that distorts the image. So if he has multiple lenses, he can look in all different directions and correct for the, for the aberration, the distortion caused by the water. You see, as my friend Buddy Davis says, he's designed to do what he does do and does do it well, because that's what God did. He made the creatures fully formed, fully functioning right from the beginning with no any hint of any evolutionary ancestors. See, the evidence in God's world confirms what we read in God's word. We all know that it didn't take millions of years of wind and water to carve out those shapes. We knew that there was an artist who designed that, who got together a team with explosives and chisels and all the rock chisels, etc., and they carved out that. You can read the story there at Mount Rushmore of how that happened. And it's just like this computer here didn't build itself as a result of an explosion in an electronics factory. 
And you see, that's why the Apostle Paul says the evidence is in God's world, in the, in the things that he's made, for even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. And as I say, I, we say to people, you know, Richard Dawkins is a very famous vehement atheist. Why is he fighting against someone he doesn't believe exists? He knows that God is, exists. He just doesn't want to be accountable to him. You see, friends, we've got to remember that this is not an issue of science. It's a spiritual issue. Men and women are in rebellion against God and they use evolution and millions of excuse to brush aside the gospel and not face up to the fact that they need to repent and humble themselves before their creator. So the fossils show evidence of death, disease and destruction, rapid burial and catastrophe, sudden appearance, fully formed and complex without any ancestors and layers belief beneath. And we've just seen evidence of design by an intelligent creator. We also see that there's no evidence of evolutionary transitions. I mean, here's a hypothetical link between reptiles and birds. Look, don't get sucked in by this idea of feathered dinosaurs. Feathers don't make a, a dinosaur fly. You've got to have wings. And, uh, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you get a creature that's halfway between a bird and a, a dinosaur and a bird? You know, it has to incrementally change its legs and arms to become fly, wings. And, and it, but it's more than that. A dinosaur has a different lung system and heart system to a bird because a bird's got to have a, a different lung system to cope with flapping its wings. You ever watched a hummingbird? Incredible! The speed at which they do things and hover and move around. We can't even design... Uh, drones that can do all that. We're trying, but it takes a lot of intelligent input, doesn't it? But you know, a, a creature that's halfway between a, a dinosaur and a bird, how could it fly? How could it fly? You know, when we go to the fossil record, Archaeopteryx was supposed to be a, a transitional form, but we know that it had uh, proper feathers compared to a true bird, true feathers, and it had a wing structure that meant it was true. Is there a missing link between fish and amphibians? No. The candidate they put up a few years ago, they discovered, the, they discovered uh, footprints below that transition, supposed transitional form. And by the way, uh, so they knew that that transitional form wasn't true because there was already a creature that was walking around before this one was halfway in between. So you know, every time they fought, find new fossils, they have to change their story. But this is the evidence they're often looking at. Most people don't realise that most of the dinosaurs, there's no complete skeletons. I remember mean, just reading recently, they were selling a, uh, a Tyrannosaurus skeleton uh, at, at auction there. I think it went for $15, $16 million. But it actually wasn't one skeleton. It was actually made up from three different, three different uh, uh, fossils that were found. And so there's very few complete fossils, and so they have to fill in the evidence with imagination. Because when we see the full skeleton of a reptile, it's got fully developed legs, we find a, a, a full fossil of a bird, it's got fully developed wings. You know, Stephen Jay Gould, who I referred to before, says, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages between major transitions in organic design, indeed our inability even in our imagination to construct functional intermediaries. Intermediates in many cases have been a persisting and nagging problem for gradualistic accounts of evolution. He said, not only can't we find them, we can't even imagine what they look like. And uh, he was at Harvard U uh, University. Colin Patterson was at the British Museum of Natural History. And he said, I fully agree with, the comments, with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. Colin Patterson had written a book about evolution. He said, if I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. Yet Gould and the American Museum people are hard to contradict when they say there are no transitional fossil forms. I will lay it on the line there's not one such fossil for which one could make a watertight argument. Isn't that interesting? And you go to the textbooks in high schools and colleges and they, th they keep on telling you there's all these transitional forms. Uh, Stephen Gould called this the trade secret of paleontology. 
Those who really know the fossils know there's no evidence of transitional forms. And Ernst Mayer, who was uh, arguably one of the greatest evolutionists, he said in his book in 2001, given the fact of evolution, that is not a theory in his view, it's a fact, one would expect the fossils to document a gradual steady change from ancestral forms to their descendants. But this is not what paleontologists find. Instead, he or she finds gaps in just about every phy phyletic series. The discovery unbroken series of species changing gradually in descending species is very rare. By the way, he uses the term species. The Bible doesn't use species. It says kinds. God created animals after their kinds. You know, wolves are a different species to domestic dogs. But domestic dogs and wolves can interbreed because they're, one of the, they're part of the same kind. So species is not what the Bible's talking about. Animals that can interbreed, most people don't know, but all the ducks, geese and swan, swans can interbreed. Go online, there's a database online that tells you about all the creatures that can interbreed with one another. That means all the ducks, geese and swans are the one created kind. So that means if there were two of every created kind that went on the ark, that's only a few animals, isn't it? It's not a huge number after all. So what do the fossils show us? Evidence of sudden appearance in the fossil record without any ancestors, evidence of design, no evolutionary transitions, and evidence of many varieties of basic kinds that are reproduced after their kind. You see, the reason we can classify the fossils with the same classification system that we use for all the living creatures is because when God created the creatures, he told them to reproduce after their kinds. So you would expect all the dead ones buried in the flood to be able to fit into the same classification system, and they do. We can recognise them as such and give them the names the same as the modern ones. You know, the evolutionists talk about their tree of life, but we don't, as I said before, we don't find the, the, we don't find the first cell from the, from the chemicals. We don't find all the transitional forms. So if you take out all the lines connecting those tips of the trees, the, the only observation we can make is the tips of the trees. That's all we see. Yet the Bible talks about God creating separate kinds, so there were separate trees. So we talk about an orchard, an orchard of many different separate trees, created kinds. God said they were to reproduce after their kind. And we read it in Genesis chapter 1. In two verses, it's repeated five times, after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. I often say to people, God knew that people in the 21st century were dumb and you have to repeat it so they got the message it was after their kind, not after some other kind. And by the way, that means that you had the original created kinds, you got different varieties before the flood and what happened at the time of the flood. All those creatures got wiped out except for those who were on the ark and those that went on the ark had to produce all the different varieties that we see today. By the way, does the Bible say that, God, uh, that Noah had to go, up and, uh, go out and round up the animals? No. It tells us that God brought the animals to Noah. And I'm glad. Why? Because God could select the best representatives of each kind with the best genetics to produce the varieties that would survive in the post-flood world. He knew what the world would be like after the flood, so he could select the best breeding pairs. Isn't that wonderful? And you know what else is wonderful? Everyone in this room is different. Isn't that great? It'd be a boring world if we're all the same. But you think about it. There's 8 billion people alive today. Think of the billions that have lived and died. How awesome is God? That means that Adam and Eve had in them all the genetics to make all the billions of people different that ever des that descended afterwards. Whoa, doesn't that blow your mind? And see, so that's what evolution does. It robs God of the glory that should be his and the praise that should be given to him as our creator. So we see lots of varieties, but within each basic kind. So at, at our zoo at the Ark and Museum, we've got a zorse and a zonkey. Why? Because horses, zebras and donkeys can interbreed. They're all part of the horse kind. And, and so it goes on. We've got many basic kinds. And so when we see fossils like trilobites,
They all have the same body plan and features, even though they've got different ornamentation and their head, head sizes might be different, they all have the same body plan and they're always trilobites. They stay the same. They don't change into something else. Brachiopods or lamp shells. They've got ribs on their shells and some of these are coarse, some of these are fine and uh, some of them have got dimples, but they're always brachiopods. We can recognise them in the fossil record because once they appear suddenly in the fossil record, they stay the same. They don't change into something else because all they did was reproduce after their kind. They obeyed God's command. And that's what we see. We see evidence of basic kinds staying the same. Well, I told you about these stromatolites. Remember I told you about these where you have the slime on the, on the sand near the beach? The tide comes in and covers it with sand and so the slime grows up again, the cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, the tide comes in, and you build up these layers, and these are the major fossils that we find in the pre-flood rocks, these big domal structures, and that's in the eastern Grand Canyon, and they're supposed to be, they're supposed to be a billion years old. And uh, we show people these on some of our raft trips when we have, have uh, the time to do the side hikes up the canyons. Uh, these, are, these are only babies. These are only a billion years old. The ones I, I showed you, the, the, the uh, algal cells under the microscope are three and a half billion years old. They're from Western Australia. And 500 miles away, on the coast of West Australia, we see living stromatolites that are identical to the fossil ones. They haven't changed in three and a half billion years. They stayed the same because they reproduced after their kind. And... Uh, on the shores of Moreton Bay, Brisbane, Australia, which is the east, on the east coast, just north of the most easterly point of the east coast, we have this brachiopod lingula that, that lives quite happily there. You can go to the, to the bottom of the fossil record, supposedly 500 million years ago, you find exactly the same brachiopod doing exactly the same thing. It hasn't changed. Here's an interesting uh, fish. This is the coelacanth. It uh, supposedly died out 66 million years ago. That means in the layers above there, less than 66 million years old, we don't find any of these fish fossils. And so they thought it had gone extinct. And, and they thought it was a transitional form, that the fins were, were on the way to becoming legs. Well, guess what? In 1938, they found living coelacanths off the coast of Madagascar on the Comoro Islands. And uh, they found them since swimming off the coast of Indonesia and Japan and they've videotaped them moving, swimming around, and they're perfectly designed to do what they do, and they do it well. Uh, but it sort of begs the question, what were these guys doing for 66 million years? Where were they hiding that there were none, of, none of them got preserved in the layers above? It doesn't make sense. What makes sense is that the coelacanths were living at the time of the flood came. Some of them got buried, some of them survived, and that was only 4,350 years or so ago. And so it's quite logical. See, the millions of years never happen, and the Bible explains the evidence that we see in the real world. And then we see these fossil ginkgos. We know what the... We can, we can classify the fossil because it's identical to the living. It hasn't changed. Here's an interesting fossil. This is a wallamai pine. Uh, the one on the left is found 120 miles west of Sydney, downtown Sydney, which isn't a small city, by the way. It's over five and a half million and it sprawls like Chicago does all over the, all over the countryside. But uh, this was supposed to have died out 100, 160 million years ago. And so there were no Wallamai pines found in the layers above 160 supposedly million years ago. And then in 1994, a national park ranger was working through a remote canyon in a wilderness area that's only 60 miles west of downtown Sydney, and he found living Wallamai pines. There's only a couple of groves of them. And you know what? They're protected lest they get destroyed. But wait a minute. How could they have survived for 160 million years and now we've got to protect them? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is that they were living before the flood. Some got buried and some survived. People often say, what about how did, how did the plants reproduce after the flood? What about all the debris that was still floating on the on the waters of the flood, when the waters went down, 
a lot of those seeds and debris, a lot of plants can asexually bud, like olives, they'll grow from a, from a, a twig, and in the mud that's settled. And so, oh, and by the way, you notice that even when it says in the Genesis account that the flood, the, the land was dry, God let, made Noah stay in the ark another 57 days. Why did he do that? He doesn't tell us, but I suspect it was to give the plants time to grow so when the animals got off, they had food to eat. See, God thinks of everything. And uh, we know what fossil crabs and crayfish are because we can identify them from the living ones and same with the beetles. And so what else do we see? We see evidence of rapid mass destruction and burial on a global scale in a catastrophe, the flood. And so we don't find the fossils on, in singular, we find them in massive graveyards, like this graveyard of trilobite fossils in Morocco. Or uh, these, this is what the rocks around Cincinnati look like. Cincinnati is famous for all, all its clams and corals and bracket, but trillions of them buried. Uh, and so uh, they're there, and we see them in the Grand Canyon as well. Uh, we see lace corals and brachiopods. Uh, Bryozoans are lace corals, are colonial corals. We see these crinoids all broken up, like here in this limestone. All those dicks have fallen up apart, so it's you know, a huge mass graveyard. And we see these corals all in every which way. That's not the way they lived. By the way, you know, you go to textbooks and museums and they have the fossils laid out and they have a, a drawing of this is where the fossils lived, this is where the creatures lived, and this is what the environment looked like. Well, when we dig up a fossil, do we see the, the environment? Do we know that this is where they lived? No, because we weren't there back then to see them living there. Do we know that this is where they died? No, because we weren't there to see them die. Do we know where they're buried? Ah, yes, we do, because we're digging them up where they were buried. That's the only thing we know for sure. All the rest is a story made up about the fossils. Here's a, an interesting fossil. That's in southern Israel in Maktesh Ramon. There's a boy for scale. You can see him up there. And let's zoom in. These are these giant fossil ammonoids. These are ammonites. These are coiled marine creatures. And they had a head like a squid, similar to the Nautilus that we see alive today. Well, here's an interesting fossil graveyard. That's chalk. Everyone's familiar with the White Cliffs of Dover, the cliffs, White Cliffs of the English Channel Coast. That's a type of limestone. And uh, it's 1,000 feet thick. And here's, the, here's the, uh, what it looks like under the microscope. Trillions of microscopic shellfish. Okay. So... The fossil order is therefore the order of burial during the flood. And so we begin in the pre-flood world with fossil stromatolites with the tides coming in and out. In fact, we also find these stromatolites in a reef structure in the eastern Grand Canyon. And so what happened in the flood is that uh, pre-flood ecosystems were progressively destroyed. Where did the flood begin, by the way? The fountains of the great deep broke open. Where's the great deep? The Hebrew tells you it was in the bottom of the ocean. The ocean floor broke open. So which creatures would get affected first by the flood? The ocean floor creatures. And so it's possible that there was a, a, a reef structure that, that fringed the pre-flood continent, these stromatolites, and it protected in the lagoon, these jellyfish and fossil, fossil flatworms. And so what we see is that the flood, the, audio, the vertical sequence of the waters coming up onto the continents, the, vertic, the, sorry, the horizontal sequence of going from the shallow ocean floor to the coastal region to the highlands, reflects the vertical sequence of the fossils that were formed. So for example, we only find marine fossils at the bottom of the record. Why? Because the ocean waters the shallow water marine creatures were the first affected by the flood because the fountains of the great deep broke open. And it was only as the flood waters rose to cover the continents that we then get the land creatures buried. You think about it. You, at the Grand Canyon today, at the top, you've got ponderosa pine and deer. At the bottom, you've got cacti and bighorn sheep. If you were to flood the Grand Canyon, would you bury the the, the ponderoso pine with the cacti? No, 
they'd be buried in different layers at different elevate because they represent different elevations of different ecosystems, and that's what we see in the pre-flood world. And so much of the fossil record is this is the shallow water marine creatures. In fact, in fact, the interesting thing is non, it's been estimated that 95% of the fossil record by volume and number are these shallow water marine creatures. Isn't that incredible? The trillions of tonnes of coal, that's buried fossil vegetation, is less than 5%. By the way, that tells you that most of the pre-flood oceans had to be shallow to accommodate all those creatures because they all lived just before the flood came. 95% by volume and number of the fossil record of these creatures, we can't accommodate them in the present day shallow ocean. So there had to be more in the pre-flood world. And then we've got the plants that are in the coal beds, uh, unique plants that were buried during the flood that probably represented a floating forest. And I don't have time to go into the details, but we find these in coal, are associated with coal beds. And so the vertical sequence represents the horizontal progression of the floodwaters coming up onto the oceans. We find the dinosaurs are only buried with certain plants. And there's lots of dinosaurs, actually there's very few when you think about it, there's probably only about 50 or 60 kinds of dinosaurs. Many of them were misclassified as, parent, as, uh, as large and small when they were juveniles, they were given different species names. And then when we get to the top of the fossil record, we get mammals and flowering plants buried. So the fossil record represents the burial order of a flood. It really is that simple. And what do we read? The ocean waters flood of the continents. What do the rock layers show? Evidence of marine fossils in rock layers that covers the continents. And these layers are widespread rock layers. They cover most of the continents between continents. And the Grand Canyon, the lowest layer there is called the Tapete Sandstone. That little cliff, that's the view from the South Rim. Here it is up close, it's 300 feet thick. Most people don't realise that it can be traced all the way across North America. And in fact, we see it in places like Colorado Springs. We see it in uh, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. We can actually trace it across North Africa to the Middle East. We can see it in Southern Israel at Timna. It's got the same sandstone, it's got the same features, it's got an erosion surface underneath it, and it's got the crystalline foundation rocks of the continent. In fact, we now know that we can trace this sandstone all the way across Asia to East China and South Korea. The Red Wall Limestone, halfway up the walls of the Grand Canyon. Why do they call it the Red Wall Limestone, by the way? We're smart geologists. You see, the Red Wall Limestone forms a red wall. And we can see the same limestone in Southern Ireland. This is a, a, a Ross Castle, underneath Ross Castle at Kalani, in Killarney. We can see it in the Yorkshire Dales and in Northern England. The same limestone is found in the Himalayas. That's across several continents. That's exactly what you'd expect. And it's a fossil graveyard like this is here. And time is running out, but I want to tell you this because this is powerful evidence. When I talked about the chalk beds. It's a type of limestone, 1,000 feet thick. It's made up of of uh, microscopic fossils like this, but we can trace it to Northern Ireland and we can trace it down as far as Israel. Below that cliff is a brook, a dry brook from which a shepherd boy collected five smooth stones to slay a giant. And the same chalk is found in the Midwest of the United States, from uh, Alabama and Arkansas to Colorado, from, from Oklahoma and Texas all the way up to the Dakotas. The same, lime, the same chalk beds are found in southern Western Australia. It's a global fossil graveyard. Well, how did it form? Evolutionary geologists say it took millions of years because it's sand grain by sand grain by sand, lime grain by grain slowly descending to the ocean floor. But what other fossils do we find in these chalk beds? Well, if you don't believe me, go to Fort Hayes in central western Kansas to the museum there and you'll see these fossils. Uh, crinoid fossils, beautifully preserved. A 12-foot long fossil, a fossil fish with an undigested fish in its stomach. Pliosaurs, 15 to 18 foot long. 12 foot to 10 foot wide uh, turtles. We find dinosaur and bird fossils. How would you bury these large creatures together if it was grain by grain deposition over millions of years? 
And, and these are large sea, land and air dwelling creatures and they're buried up on the continents. Only if the ocean waters rose and swept across the continents catastrophically burying these creatures. It didn't take millions of years and, and it affected the land, the air and the sea all at the same, same time. Well, let's wrap up. Is the rock layer its fossil sequence real? Yes. Is it simply co contrived? No. Does it show evolution and development? No. Does it show millions of years? No. Do we find marine creatures buried and fossilised on the continents? Yes. Were the creatures buried rapidly? Yes. Do the rock layers have a global extent? Yes. Are the rock layers and fossils consistent with a global flood? Absolutely, yes. You see, when we start with God's word as our authoritative eyewitness account of earth history, the fossil, makes, the fossil record makes sense in the light of the flood. With a sudden appearance of fossil creatures because they, God created them and then he buried them in the flood. They show complex design, complex design and varieties, but they show death and distinct, extinction because the flood was a judgment. The burial order of the, of the fossils is the burial order of the flood <clears throat> and the rock layers cover the continents with marine fossils in them, just as you would expect from a global catastrophic flood when the ocean waters rose over the continents. So the rock layers and fossils remind us of the consequences of sin <clears throat> and of God's judgment. And of course, why do kids love rocks and fossils? Because we're exploring God's world in the light of God's word. Well, thank you very much. And uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that we can stand confidently on your word because the evidence in your world supports your word. Help us to stand tall <clears throat> and to use uh, the, the science of your world to convict and convince people by your Holy Spirit so that removed, stumbling blocks are removed and doubts so that they can hear the gospel message and be saved. So thank you. Bless us now as we move into the service and we pray and ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. We'll see you back in here for the morning service in just a few minutes.